Good morning, everybody. Let's just acknowledge the presence of God in this place, His love for us. He longs to be with us. We get to be together. Let's worship Him. He is worthy. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord? Roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before.
source of grace you go me up lifting me up our greatest your love from the heights of heaven you step down to earth innocent perfection give your life for us we are amazed yes we stand in awe for we have been changed by the power of the cross come on we say how great how great how great is your love how great how great how great is your love how great Take a moment right now and just pause before the Lord. Close your eyes and just acknowledge his presence around you in your life.
God, your power is remarkable. There's not a moment that you've left our side. Even in the pain, God, you've been here. And in the, in the joy, you've given us those moments, those gifts. Even pain can be a gift because it can make us more like you and help us to know you more. Lord, you are almighty. You are so high and lifted up. And right now you're being told by angels and elders that you are holy, 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 that you are worthy and that there is no one like you. And yet at the same time, you're here with us, God. You are unsearchable and yet knowable. Father, I ask this morning that you would make your peace so known to every mind in this place. You're such a good father, and you love to give gifts to your children. So I thank you for peace for all of our minds this morning, for our hearts, in the trials, in the wondering. Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. Reveal yourself to us today as that, Lord. Thank you that we can speak to you right now because of Jesus. You're so good, our King. You're so good. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
This song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs, a thousand more. Hallelujah, Jesus, our King. Let's keep standing and just uh, give him thanks. Uh, our satisfaction is only found in him and in nothing else. He says he'll be with us to the very end of the age. He says he'll never leave us. He won't forsake us. He says I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our satisfaction is only in him. He tells us he gives us everything we need for our enjoyment. So we don't have to spend a lifetime going after something else. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much. Your presence is what we want more than anything. We just praise you. We thank you. Go ahead and rest yourselves. Have a seat. It's swell to be with you here today. You know, we, we talk about generosity. Generosity is essentially us being a pass-through account for God. Because he does give us everything we need and we don't find satisfaction in, in really anything else. And the more we hang on to things, the less satisfied we are. And we, we can get stressed out by that. And we can worry about that. And I think that's why Miss Joplin really nailed, nailed it when she said, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. And that's true. That's really true. And we thank him for that. And um, what we want to do is be able to listen to his spirit so that we can uh, pass things along, the things that he gives us. And for example, um, in 2 Corinthians, he says this, Paul writes, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. So we want to be able to do that. We want to have open hands with everything that he gives to us. But, but sometimes um, when we're in that place, we're not in a place to share what he's given us. And so we want to be sensitive to his Holy Spirit when he tells us, first of all, where we ought to be and what we ought to share. And then it's up to us to have the open hands and recognize what, what he gave us and what we have from him is acquired during our presence with him. So that's so important as well. And uh, I'm going to give you a, a real Captain Obvious example of this um, that came up. So the jail team goes in every Sunday morning. We arrive at the jail about 8.30, and at 9 o'clock, we're in the pod, B1, B2, B3, and we're setting up, we're ready to go, and the folks go out, the, the corrections officer will kind of make an announcement that this is available in this room here, and, and some of the team will go out and actually kind of, kind of carnival bark, try to get some folks in there. We'll get between anywhere from two to three to seven to eight folks that will come in there, which is great. Um, I was I stopped in I was in the in the jail last Wednesday, and I came in around I was I ended up going into the the cell area the pod a little afternoon, and uh, I did something a little bit different this time. Uh, one of the gentlemen that um, met with us on a Sunday a couple of weeks before I thought well I'd, I'd see if you wanted to spend a little time together so I grabbed him and I said hey the other two fellows that were with us. Um, you want to see if they want to come as well. 
And so uh, he said, sure. And I said, well, while you're at it, you can fight anyone else you'd like. And so I go into the little space where we meet, and I see him knocking on all these cell doors. And it ends up being about a dozen guys end up coming in, sitting with me. Now, well, yeah, <laughs> that was good. But it wasn't because I was the flavor of the day. And, and so here's, here's why. Here's the interesting part. Here's what the Spirit kind of shows us. So when you're in the jail, hopefully that doesn't happen to, to many of you soon, um, you get two hours of free time outside of your cell for the entire day. That's typically between 8.30 and 10.30. I was informed of this when I had the dozen or so fellows with me. And so he said to me, this one guy said, if you moved the time on Sunday morning, you'd get a lot more people in there because our Sunday morning time is smack in the middle of their free time. So they have to make a choice. Oh, and, and many do to come do that. But we'd get many more if we did it not during their free time, which would mean that instead of the team going to the jail kind of during our first service and coming to second service, they would go to our first service and then go over to the jail for second service. We might have double, maybe triple, the people that would be in there. We're still working on that. That would still be there. But this is what the Holy Spirit does. So he, he shows us something, right, to the one gentleman who explained that. And then he's, he's wondering, are we willing to maybe inconvenience ourselves, go through what it would take to try and swap all that over and have an open hand in that? This one's fairly simple. It was pretty straightforward. But sometimes there are all these things in life that we have where we are able to make a choice, but we really need to be connected to his spirit uh, to be aware of and be cognitive of what he wants to do with us. And he wants to do so much with us. And that's such good news that we get to do that. So how might we listen to his spirit? And how, what, what might he do to have us rearrange what we can do to be really generous with our very selves? Now, at East Point, we've got uh, these different ways that we can give. We can give with our giving app. We can give with the boxes in the back. Um, and we need to do that. And we need to give our, our very selves to these. So all these things can continue to go. But we really really need to maintain our presence with him so we can hear from him, so we can receive that same comfort that we then can comfort others with. That's so important. I heard this, this, this quote uh, yesterday, and I think it's so important because some of us might not be hearing from God right now. We might be in a dry place. It doesn't have to be that way. And the, the quote was that... Um, if, you, if you're not hearing from God right now, if you feel like you're separated from him, that God is best found by us in the place where we last left him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. We can just retrace where we decided to go our own way and find you there. And you're just waiting because you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, Father, bless what you give to us as we release it to this world. In Jesus' name, amen. In a world filled with countless quests, each one offering a unique set of challenges and rewards, it's easy to get lost in the pursuit of the next great adventure. From conquering mountains to exploring the depths of the ocean, there is no shortage of opportunities to test our limits and discover new frontiers. It's not for the faint of heart. It requires dedication, perseverance, and a willingness to confront the challenges that lie ahead. But amidst the sea of quests, there is one that stands above them all. One that offers not only adventure and excitement, but also purpose and meaning beyond measure. It is the ultimate quest, the journey to discover who Jesus is.
So embark on your quest with wonder and the steadfast knowledge that in him, all things are possible. Hey, good morning, church family. How are we today? Oh, man. So Kurt preached. We're going to do communion. We'll get out of here early. No, I'm just kidding. I, I'm so glad he said what he said, because when we try to be generous out of a place of obligation or duty, we're being just like the Pharisees. His invitation is come abide and remain in him. And he's going to work through us for the renewal of all things in greater Portland. And so our call isn't to just give our resources, our time. It's to give ourselves as a living sacrifice. Amen. And so this morning, uh, I just wanted to highlight a few things because we're going to jump into a, a bit of a unique Sunday uh, from a teaching standpoint. But first, to those that are guests, welcome. We're glad you're tuning in online. If you are, if you're here in the auditorium, we're glad if you're a guest with us. It's been a couple weeks. Thanks for being here. We're in an exciting season as a church family. Also, to those in Cumberland County Jail, Kurt's coming for you. The jail team's coming for you. And uh, we just love all that God is doing in and through lives there at County Jail. Amen. It's just such a good thing over there. It's such a hard season of life, I'm sure. How much brighter is that hope when the gospel is brought into that space? And uh, we're excited to see what's going to happen. And so also we're going to throw this, this slide up there as well. Partner Appreciation Night. We've gone over this the uh, past couple weeks. We're sending it out in our newsletter and our email communications. Please, if you're one of our partners or you're living into partnership with us, we would love to have you there. We're going to have some fun, cast some vision and just love on you and appreciate you uh, for all that you do for God's kingdom here and through this local church. Um, today... We're going to ask this question in, in our, uh, our Quest 52 series, which will be closing and coming to an end uh, on September 10th. So we only have a few more weeks with Mr. Mark Moore and his commentaries and the text that he's been able to lay out for us over the past year. It's been a year. It's like the longest year of my life, if you're really asking me. <laughs> but it's been so much fun because we've just walked with the, the person and presence of Jesus all through the New Testament. We've covered so many big texts as a church, and I think it's kept our, our eyes fixed on Jesus in this season of life, and we cannot relent. We have to be all about Him. And today, we're asking this question, why did Jesus die? This is gonna be a heavy topic today. I hope it, it actually stirs us to the place of becoming troubled because that's what the crucifixion was. It was a troubling thing. But I also pray that it leads us to a place of complete understanding of this was always in God's hand. And eventually, like we sang in worship in the, the first few songs, that it'll lead us to a place of worship where we might not even be able to speak because we realize that Jesus had to die so that you and I can be reconciled to our Father. There was no other way. And I'm, I'm gonna read through the text. A lot of the text today is gonna speak and preach for itself. So we're gonna take longer passages of scripture. So I just ask that you hang in there with me. If you have your Bible, I'm gonna give you the text we're gonna go through. We're gonna put it on the screen, but today is an active learning, right? I was so bad at this in school. The teacher would be like, we need you to have your listening face on or put on your listening ears. And that's when I tuned out. So don't do that to me, please. It would be great payback if you did. But if you could hang in there and follow along through the text, I'm going to try to navigate us through three major aspects of the scripture. One is the Old Testament prophetic letter God wrote through Isaiah to the people of Israel. Right, so we're going to be on Isaiah 53 today, and we're going to read a good portion of the passage there. And that's going to point us 700 years ahead to first century Jerusalem, where Jesus walked the earth. So just help us get that in your head. 700 years before Jesus walked the earth, Isaiah penned the letter about the Messiah. Right, so we're going, to, we're going to reckon that and wrestle with that against a, 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 a historical, verifiable text written by a physician named Luke who writes about the account of Jesus' crucifixion and what happened on that forsaken day. It's like reading a history book. We're seeing the, the detailed account for account, what happened in chronological order. And then we're going to see years, years later, that, that Jesus comes back to, to meet his, his disciple John nearly 50 years later, they think, to be able to give him the revelation of Jesus Christ, where we see actually 
what's happening in the heavenly hosts and in the throne room of God today. And so we're going to span all of these years to understand why did Jesus die? Now we could spend months together unpacking every little iota of the law, all of the scripture, because it all points to him. And that's where we want to go today in 35 minutes is get to Jesus through Isaiah, Luke, and Revelation. Are you with me? Okay, so we're going to start in Luke, in, uh, in Luke chapter 23 is where we're going to start. And this is, this is where Luke is writing about Jesus. He's been, he's been sent from, from Pontius Pilate's palace and he's been sent to the outer walls of the city. And so Jesus, many people have heard of the Dia de la Rosa, which is the, the walk that Jesus made. Let me just tell you that walk was actually invented in Rome, right? Jesus's journey was not the Dia de la Rosa. Jesus was actually walked outside and somebody else carried his cross for him. And he was walked to the outer wall, the city of Jerusalem. And this is where he went with two other men to be crucified, that forsaken Friday. Friday was the day the Passover meal was going to be eaten that evening. This is when Jesus was cast from the presence of, of the, the high priest. They were heading off to do their Passover meal preparation, and Jesus was sent to be crucified. And so we're going to pick up in verse 32 in chapter 23. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Jesus is brought out with criminals who had due payment. We're going to see that. They, this was, they, they deserved this. And here's Jesus, an innocent man that's being brought out for crucifixion. Now, many of us will look at the wonder of the cross that's over here to my left, and they'll, we'll look at this as this beautiful symbol of our freedom. But before Jesus was put on this cross, this was not a beautiful symbol of anyone's freedom. This was the most excruciating form of torture in human history. Think about that. There is no other torture device or way to abuse and punish and kill somebody than a Roman cross. And I'm going to share a, a little bit of the graphic details because I think it's important to understand both what Jesus went through and also how accurate and nearly perfect Isaiah 53 and many of the Messianic Psalm 22, all of these, all of these passages point to the iota of how Jesus the Messiah was to suffer. Now with a cross, the cross was laid down on the ground and they put the, the person on the cross, stretched their arms out and they drove these spikes through the wrist, through a nerve that would make your hands go numb and your whole body writhe in pain and they'd cross your legs and on the lower part, they'd drive another spike through both feet, right through the bones. And so when they'd hang you up, the only thing hanging you on that cross were those three spikes. writhing in pain. This was not a resting torture, trying to breathe. The, the, the cavity of the rib cage wouldn't allow the lungs to breathe. So you had to pull yourself up by your wrists in these spikes to be able to take a deep breath. The intent was asphyxiation. Towards the end of their life on this cross, they would be panting like an animal trying to catch their breath. So as we worship Jesus, as we sing praises, as we file into this place on a Sunday morning, we cannot forget what he went through for us. We can't forget what the cross meant in that day. And we look back in some of the Old Testament passages that anyone who's hung on a pole is a cursed man. And that's what Jesus was doing. He was hung on that cross, not to pay for his sin, but to take upon himself our sin curse. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was written a written notice above him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. The ridicule, 
that Jesus went through on that hill called Calvary, Golgotha, the place of the skull. This was hell on earth in this moment where all of humanity, the religious leaders and the pagan Romans were mocking him, mocking Jesus, the Messiah, the chosen one, the one who had come from heaven to step into your and I's life, these men's life, to say, let me take upon you the pain, the hurt, the disappointment, the sin, the rebelliousness, to take it all upon himself so that you and I wouldn't have to. And there he is, mocked, spit upon. They gave him wine vinegar, here, part your thirst, Jesus. This should help. Mocking Jesus while he and the other two criminal, cr criminals were writhing in pain on this forsaken cross. Quite the picture, huh? We don't think of that all the time when we come to him. Sometimes we come to him and we say, Jesus, these are the things I just need for you to do in my life. These are the things that make me uncomfortable. These are the things that I feel like I'm, I'm suffering. Do we ever look upon him on that cross and say, oh, wait, 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 wait. It brings everything back into context. It brings everything back into the fact that he came to save us by taking our sin upon himself. And in Isaiah chapter 53, I'm going to flip there. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2, this is what Isaiah, this is what God said about his Messiah through the prophet Isaiah. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Isaiah is accounting what the people of Israel will eventually do when they encounter the Messiah. They weren't attracted to him. He was familiar with pain, and they would hold him in low esteem. What if this Jesus, this Messiah, came into our assembly today? Would we hold him in high esteem and high regard? This humble, lowly, from Nazareth, came in here teaching with authority, but he wasn't all that maybe charismatic or what we had hoped for. He wasn't that king that we wanted. He wasn't helping us get our way. Would we dispose of him like the Israelites did? Will we just dispose of him outside the city walls and say, take care of him before the Passover meal? We want him out of our sight. Or would we worship him? Would we lay our lives down with him because of what he's done for us? And so the question, why did Jesus die? The first thing that I wanna highlight is he died to become the curse for us. That he died to become the curse for us. You can throw that slide up on the screen. This is, this is so important for us to recognize that we inherently, because of our sin, our rebellion, our disobedience, all of these things, which we'll unpack in a little bit, all of these things heap upon us and they're not something to try to clean up like a messy room. They're not something to try to renovate like an old rundown house. It's a spiritual curse that we've inherited by being born into this broken world. Now yet does God shower his love and his favor upon his people and that we're able to find ourselves free from him, from the curse? Or are we able to find the glory and majesty of a sunrise and the beauty of the mountains and behold him? Absolutely, we live in this, this tension of both the cursedness of man because of the fall in the garden and the kingdom that is to come that our souls desperately long for. And we exist in this middle ground. Our souls are being waged war upon. We're trying to find purpose and pleasure. And many of us today are doing it in the wrong places. Only Jesus can take the curse from you because he took it upon himself. The curse that he himself was destined to, to death in hell 
even though he had committed no sin. That he was willing to look at our eternal life sentence and say, I'll take it because I love them. You and I deserve an eternal sentence because of our brokenness, our sinfulness, our iniquity, our transgressions, all of these things leading us short of God's righteousness. And all God wants is us to be with him, but our rebellion leads us away. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to make the bridge and I'm going to lay my life down so they can come back to you, Father. He became the curse for you and for me. So when we pray, I encourage you, before we come with these things that we need from him, may we fix our eyes on that cross and picture what he did for us. And maybe it puts some of our life a bit in perspective. That this Jesus, the gospel that has transformed humanity since 2,000 years, 2000 years ago, is still transforming hearts today. But we have to understand why he died for us. So one of the criminals, remember there's two of them, one on his right and one on his left. One of the criminals who hung there had the bravery to hurl insults at him. He says, aren't you the Messiah? <laughs> this is the funny part. Save yourself and us, <laughs> right? He's like, if you could save yourself, if you could take us with you, that'd be great. While he's hurling insults at Jesus, right? He's mocking Jesus while he's actively dying on the cross. A picture of humanity for sure. Those that reject Jesus, those that don't believe in him and they question him and they stomp on him and they want this gospel news to be quiet. It's just an antiquated way for people to control other people in this form of religion, right? All of these people are hurling insults at Jesus even today in 2023 and they don't realize they're hanging and dying on a cross themselves in this earthly torment of the brokenness and, and death all around them and hurt and pain and spiritual bankruptcy, they're sitting there hurling insults at Jesus while they're dying their own death. And yet many of us know that the other one, this is what he says to his buddy that's hanging on the cross, but the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when I, you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. These are the two heart dispositions of man right here. These are the two heart dispositions. One so angry at their circumstance, they'll take anyone down, including Jesus in the process. And yet there's another who wakes up to the reality and understands that right next to me is Jesus. The one who's always been near to me. He's faithful to stand near to me. And all we have to do is say, Jesus, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. I deserve what I'm getting. I deserve these deeds, or these deeds that I have deserve death. I'm rebellious in nature. And many of you say, oh no, I live a good life. Imagine if you were put on trial for every thought you've ever had in your life. What would people think? If you're like me, you don't want people to know what you think. You don't want people to know what goes on up here. Maybe I'm just crazy, but I have to believe there's a few others like me. Right? That, that when somebody including your spouse, right? Says something to you and you snap your head around and there's that glare and they go, what? And you go, never mind, never mind. You know, erase, erase it. Ashley, I've never thought those things. <laughs> but you know what I mean? There's this inner propensity to, to almost be animalistic and, and, and con keep control and, and comfort all around you and, and we'll fight it off at every given chance. But thank God for his Holy Spirit who works inside of us and breaks that down so that we can become his righteousness over time. But apart from him, apart from him, our propensity is to be hanging there, actively dying and shouting insults and curses as we go. And if you don't think that Jesus isn't right next to you, He's hanging on a cross next to a criminal as he dies. And he says, today you will be with me in paradise. But why do we wait so long? 
So many of us wait so long because we want to think we can have the world have our cake and eat it too. We can do this Jesus thing when we want, but we can also have the world as we desire it. And Jesus is saying, choose this day. Pick the criminal you are because we're all criminals. Which one is going to align with your heart? We have to recognize that we are actively dying on this earth. No matter your worldview, if it's not in Christ Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, it's wrong. Jesus has proved time and time again for me and countless others in this room that he is faithful and true and that he's come to reveal the truth and the sheep that believe in the truth will hear his voice and we will follow him. And this criminal hanging there recognized his sinfulness in that moment repented from his brokenness and accepted Jesus and that day he would be with him in paradise. Imagine that. And there's many of us that have gone through that journey in the matter of a day. We've called upon the Lord. We've asked him in the darkest of night. We've called upon his name and we said, Jesus, would you just come rescue me? Would you come into my heart? I'll follow you all my days. I'm gonna fall on the floor. I need you, Jesus. And how faithful is he to say, here, let me help you up. Let me give you a new heart, a new life. I'll revive you in this moment and I'll take upon myself every ounce of pain, every ounce of sin, every ounce of brokenness. I'll take it upon myself so Keenan, you can walk free. That's what he's done for each and every one of us. And when we call upon his name. Flipping back to Isaiah 53, starting in verse five. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us, each of us has turned our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Our iniquity, our inability to become equal with the righteousness of God. There is an eternal unequalness that none of us by our works and by our good measures and by our deeds and by our servant hours and by our, our generosity, none of us can close that gap to become of God's righteousness. Jesus closes that gap. Our transgressions, they're the decisions we make in the middle of our sinful condition that are in rebellion to God. They can look small, they can look huge, they can have massive lifelong implications, or they could be something that we don't believe anybody knows about. Those are our transgressions because sin is not just an action. Sin is our terminal condition apart from Jesus. He had to die so that he could make up for our iniquity. He could forgive our transgressions and he could heal our sin. Why? So that he could make his kingdom available to everyone, to every single person, even the criminal on the cross. You might think that you're too far gone. You might think, well, I've really done it this time. The nail's driven in the coffin. This guy is on a cross with the nails driven in his hand and he had the bravery and the courage to humble himself, repent of his sin and ask Jesus to rescue him. And Jesus did. This is the most drastic picture of how radical the love is of Jesus Christ. That he would look beyond every single sin, detail, transgression, and all of these things that you and I feel like stack up against us that make us unlovable to a loving God, that make us unholy to a holy God. You're right, they do, and he still came after you. He still came into your life. He still wrapped you with his love and drew you near by Jesus. And so may we not get caught being the other criminal. Out of pride, and out of arrogance, and out of apathy, raining insults on Jesus by denying him. It's almost like Joshua saying, choose this day whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So we look upon Jesus on that forsaken cross. Isaiah prophesied about all of this 700 years before. And he assures us that Jesus is taking this curse upon himself so that his kingdom 
his eternal life, his glory and his splendor available to each and every person this side of heaven and eternally in heaven. So in Luke chapter 23, picking back up, I think in verse 44, I told you it's a lot of Bible today. I love it. <laughs> so chronologically, Luke records this and it's familiar to us, but don't lose this. this, this there's so much here. And in verse 44, it was now about noon. So it's Friday at noontime and darkness has come over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Three hours of darkness coming all over the land of Israel for the sun stopped shining because his sun was dying. The sun is God's earthly, glorious radiance that gives life to everything it touches. It keeps us perfectly in order here on earth. It's this balancing form of energy that keeps us alive, but it is not God. It is a symbol of God's love for us. And here is his son, Jesus, the one who created all things and in all things were made to worship him. Here's Jesus dying on a cross. And you wonder why it got dark. God's face was turning from his son because he's sitting there taking on the sin of the world upon himself. And it was dark. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. How, what's, what's up with the verse that, that, that the temple curtain was torn in two? In the same way that the temple was torn in two, Jesus gives his spirit back to the Father. The same spirit of God that alighted him like a dove in the river Jordan when he was baptized is the same spirit that God is releasing back to the Father. The Holy Spirit who himself is Yahweh dwelled in the temple. Man was separated from God, the presence of God because of our sinfulness. We were separated from him by a six inch thick curtain from ceiling to floor. And that ripped in half when Jesus released his spirit back to his father's hands. Why? Because the spirit of God no longer dwells in temples built by human hands. The Holy Spirit of God, the one who, who dwelled like fire among the people of Israel is now wanting to make his home within each and every one of us. And if we're living in our rebellion, if we're living in sin, if we're walking in unrighteousness, if we're choosing to indulge in this world and not walk in the way of Jesus, do we think that his spirit is gonna be pleased to dwell within us? Jesus is releasing his spirit back to the Father to be returned back to his followers at Pentecost. The tongues of fire came upon them. The signs and wonders accompanied because the Holy Spirit no longer dwell in a temple but dwelt within us, the collective holy temple of God, the people who would choose to follow his son, Jesus. That's good news, that his presence left a building to come and dwell in each and every one of us, even if we live in South Portland, Maine, even if we're here. That's the glory of God. So imagine as Jesus, the, the, the earth is getting darker. Jesus is gasping for breath. He lets his life go. Crucifixion took up to five days. And in a matter of six hours, Jesus says, this is enough. He sends the Holy Spirit, God in flesh, sends the Holy Spirit back to his Father in heaven. He breathes his last and he dies in the temple, tear, tear, the temple curtain tears in two. You and I try to separate earthly and heavenly. And right here in the text, we realize that the supernatural, the heavenly presence of God is just as real in this moment as it is in the Bible that he wants to dwell among us. He wants to live inside of us. He wants to work through us, church. This is not just a fancy story to read on Easter morning or the week prior. This is the here and now reality that Jesus has taken the curse upon himself so that you and I are invited to his kingdom and can allow his presence to dwell within us. And that is the invitation that he has. And so as we think about this and we try to reckon with this, I wanna turn us to Revelation chapter five. In Revelation chapter five, I picture this as this, this, this is the moment that when Jesus le le just leaves this earth by his presence, he comes back to his apostles, he comes back to his disciples. And when he goes back into heaven, this is the picture in Revelation five that he paints for John. 
John is, has seen an angel of the Lord. John, Jesus' disciple, this would be probably helpful. John is, is uh, he's ne- definitely not a church father at this point. The poor guy is just completely stranded on an island in the Mediterranean because of two botched executions. They can't kill the guy. That's what happens when the Spirit of God lives in you. Some crazy things happen, right? And so the guy gets, they're like, well, we'll just leave him on this remote island. Surely nothing will happen to proliferate the church out there. Then Jesus shows up. Right, and so you can read through the first few chapters of Revelation and your jaw drops because you realize Jesus is still meeting people and he's doing it today. But this is the revelation he gives to John. John's in the throne room of God and John records, then I saw on the, in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, Yahweh, the God of the universe, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. No one in heaven can touch this thing. No one on earth can touch this thing. No one who has ever been created or ever equaled us, the angelic, anyone. They can't touch the scroll. There is no one to be found. John records, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Imagine Jesus coming in like a lamb that was slain, walking into the throne room of God, quietly, peacefully conquering sin, death, and hell. The curse is broken. And he walks in with all the humility, humble confidence in the world directly for the scroll that's in the hand of his father. Like a beaten, conquering king. He says, give me that because I've paid the price for them. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. That's you and me. If we're in Christ Jesus, God has rescued us to draw us back every tongue, nation, tribe that we're able to be his priests, that we're able to reign here on earth in his authority and his power. This is the good news of the gospel that it doesn't end when we're six feet under, that we reign in glory with Jesus and that we worship him eternally and that he'll give us dominion and power here on earth when his kingdom comes. That's the gospel. We often think of the here and now. Well, I was this and now I'm this and praise God because I have a good life and I can't wait to see him someday. He's recruited you and I into his kingdom to reign with him eternally. And so when we think that we're just gonna do this life a little bit better, if we're just gonna serve a little more humbly, if we're just gonna give a little more generously, Jesus is saying, you're going to be a priest in my kingdom. I've bought you back with the perfect spotless lamb that was crucified for the sin of the world on Passover. When the people of Israel were coming out of Egypt, when they were invited by God to come out of Egypt in these final signs and Pharaoh is, is losing his mind, wondering what's happening with this people of Israel, God said, take a sinless, spotless, unblemished lamb, sacrifice it this day, put the blood on the doorposts and I will lead you out of Egypt. Jesus Christ was the sinless, spotless lamb to lead us out of the Egypt, the curse that you and I all live called our sin. And here he is in the throne room of God 
where there's not a single person, heavenly host, angel or elder, or creature that you can't even describe that doesn't fall down in worship. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be praise and glory and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. When we're running into difficult days, when we're going through suffering and pain, we've journeyed through this over the last six weeks. My request for you is to fix your eyes on the cross, through the cross and into the heavenly throne room of what Jesus has done for you. I promise you, it'll put everything in perspective that we realize that what's happening in eternity today looks like this, and that is a blessed assurance that as our bodies waste away on this earth, as we find these earthly temples to be crumbling in our hands, may we not look and try to salvage and try to band-aid and try to fix it through good works, self-help, but may we look expectantly with our eyes fixed on heaven saying the Alpha and the Omega is coming for me and I will reign with him eternally. Why did Jesus die? To reestablish our relationship with his father so that he could usher us in as the lamb into the presence of our father in the throne room where you and I don't have to shrink back like the people Israel did when God existed on Sinai. That we don't, we don't come to a God that's in, in fear and trembling and holy thunderous. We come to a heavenly father that has his arms open wide like the father of the prodigal and says, welcome home. So picture that criminal on that cross next to Jesus, deserving death, deserving eternal hell. And the father is saying, welcome home. You've come with the lamb who was slain for you. My invitation for those of you in this room that aren't in Christ Jesus, come home to the father. Jesus has paid the price to reestablish you with the greatest love that your mind and heart and body cannot even conceive of. And he's welcoming you home today. Because Jesus looks upon you and I and says, today you will be with me in paradise. And so as we close, I want to close with one of the most glorious pictures of what's waiting for us. For you and for me, if we're in Christ Jesus, This is not a fairy tale. This is not some cute picture to be able to give us a purpose beyond this life. This is reality and this this will come to pass. And I pray soon that in Revelation 21, this is the description. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. Church, I hope we hear this this morning. He said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those are who, who are victorious will inherit all of this and I will be their God and they will be my children. But to the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all the liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. And this is the second death. I assure you, apart from Jesus, there is a second death. 
It's not a hellfire and brimstone statement. It's just reality. And you saw the list, the unbelievers, the liars, those who practice magic arts, the new age, the Wiccan, all of these things that we think are God or we want to avoid because we think there's a better God of our own making. He says, I assure you, there isn't. There is only the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And if your souls are thirsty, he will give you water that comes from the spring of life. So come to him today because he's inviting you. You can come this morning to the altar. You can come to be baptized. You can come to him. But I pray our response is not one of apathy that said, oh, that was good. That was encouraging. It's that is the reality in heaven right now. And who are we to ignore that and not worship him? Who are we to not bow down before him with the elders and the creatures and the angels? Because many of us have encountered Jesus in such a way that has dropped us to our knees and said, you are holy and I am not. Father, thank you for what you've done in my life. I want more of you. That's what the elders are doing. Not out of submission or obligation, but out of true worship. And so Jesus comes back to his disciples. And you know what he says to them in Matthew chapter 28? This is what gets me. He says, I'm not waiting for you to be priests. I'm not waiting for you to be these people of God that come in eternity. No, I want you doing it here and now. Because he says, he comes to me, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. We see that in Revelation. He has the authority. He's come back and he says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And you can be sure because I'm going with you always to the very end of the age. I don't know where you are right now in your earthly life, but I can promise you as you follow Jesus and you put your trust in him and you put your faith in him and you believe in him, you look upon the cross and say, that was for me. I receive you, Jesus. I repent of my sins. He will take you from this point, from, from earthly life to eternal life, but he'll use you today if you'll allow him to, to make disciples as his priests, ministering reconciliation to the people around you in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your families. He's gonna use us by his Holy Spirit to reconcile this broken earth back to him so that one day when we're at the end of the age, we stand before him. And he says, look what you've done on earth. Now inherit this kingdom. This is his invitation to us. So therefore, East Point Christian Church, go and make disciples of all of this region, baptizing them. Do it in a river. The presumpscate's not that bad. Just dunk them, right? Don't do it in your pond out back though. We don't want diseases and have to clean them up. But his invitation is to do the here and now because you are a priest in his kingdom if you are in Christ Jesus. Why did Jesus die? So that we can be back in relationship with his father. We can go and make disciples of Jesus who share their story with other people. His kingdom will proliferate here in greater Portland, I promise. So today, I wanna leave you with a bit of an invitation this week. A passage, as if we don't have enough passages today to read through, but I want to throw a, 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 a next steps up on the screen and invite you to, to consider some of these questions or some of these invitations. What does it look like for us to actually live in repentance like the criminal? To be fully exposed. To say, God, I'm giving it all to you. I'm dying. I need you to take this from me. And there's people in this room that have wrestled with things. Life's gotten you there, hasn't it? I'm done. This is gonna kill me here on earth. What does repentance like a criminal look like for us as the church? What if we actually worship Jesus like heaven does in the next few minutes? Declaring his goodness, worshiping, bowing with our hearts, leading ourselves closer to his throne. And could we actually share Jesus with somebody this week? Not the church, Jesus, the lamb that was slain for you and for me so we could have a relationship with his father. And if you're brave, meditating on Colossians chapter 2, 16, 6 through 15, this beautiful passage of what Jesus has done for us in Christ Jesus. So I encourage you to take a picture, write those things down. I assure, it'll get us closer to him week by week. We want to be able to put these challenges out in front of us. One, so people stop saying, I don't know where to start. Well, here we are. And two, because we need to be built up into full maturity for him to use us here in greater Portland. And so as we take communion, Picture the throne room. 
picture the broken, beaten, bloody lamb of God that was slain, that somehow came alive with the keys of death and hell in his hands and walked into the throne room of God, welcomed by all of heaven. This is what Jesus alluded to at that table in the Last Supper. He said, I won't drink of the wine again until I do in the kingdom. That he was pointing to the heavenly reality of where he was going and the work that he was doing by breaking his body for you and for me upon that forsaken Roman cross, taking our curse upon himself. We take the bread together. And the cup, this is the new covenant. Every tribe, nation, and tongue reconciled to him as a holy priesthood. If you and I are in Christ Jesus, and we remember him through this cup, that is our invitation into his kingdom. We take the cup together. Let me pray for us. Jesus, the wonder of what you went through for us when you didn't have to. The beauty of your love displayed on that cross. And you still cried out, Father, forgive them. They know what, not what they do. Oh, Jesus, we just welcome your spirit to minister to our hearts. Whatever has stood out from your word today, Father, I pray that you bring it to the front of our minds, that we meditate on it, that we wrestle with it, that we take it back to the word, to your holy scripture, and we we let it convict our hearts. We let it change our lives. That we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. Oh, Jesus, I just pray that your spirit just ministers in this moment. Come in power. Cast out the lies. Cast out any spirits that are taking people captive. Father, would you minister by your holy name in ways that only you can to a people who desire to be set apart as a priesthood. Oh, Jesus, would you lead us to a place where we're able to just worship like heaven does. We're able to bow at your feet, Jesus. And say, worthy is the lamb who is slain. We love you, Lord. And we give you our offerings and we pray that they are just a sweet aroma in your throne room today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me as we worship our King? Jesus. 
spoke to God my entire life, you know. But then as I grew older, I, I walked away from God. I stopped speaking to God every day and I put my faith in friendships. As I got older, I married the bottle of alcohol and I mean, there was really not much of a relationship at all. I got the rosaries tatted on my chest out of belief that Jesus would protect me for the rest of my life, I guess. That little bit of faith didn't really turn into much until I got sober uh, 19 months ago. And I started to recognize things in my life and how patterns played out. Went to the Salvation Army and they started teaching me more about Jesus and doing Bible studies and attending church and doing uh, morning devotions. It brings peace to me to be able to see a cross and to speak to God and to give up my will. Life is a lot easier. God has taught me to let go of myself and to think of others and to keep moving forward with my day, put my faith in Him no matter what. This baptism means to me, not the start of a new life, but to the end of my old one. To finally accept that I can be out of the dark. My name is Sean Bertulli, and today I declare that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. <laughs>